Well, once again, we welcome each and every one of you to our worship service here this morning as we begin our time of worship together. I invite you to stand um, as we come to the Lord um, and as, as he welcomes us into his presence now, as we consider his greatness, we do so in reading Psalm 55, Psalm 55. It says here, give ear to my prayer, O God. And hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they drop trouble upon me and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. And I say, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness, Selah. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. Destroy, O Lord. Divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals innocently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. Let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. Let us remember that this morning, that as we cry out to him, he is the God who saves. As we begin our time of worship and singing this morning, I invite you to get out your blue hymnals with me, and we're going to begin our time of worship and singing with hymn number 190, Are You Washed in the Blood? Let's sing unto the Lord together.
a reminder for us. We've been studying about the Passover. John taught on it this morning as we um, were looking at the Passover, the first Passover, and how the people of Israel needed to be covered by the blood. And for us this morning, the same is true. We must have salvation, be covered in the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. What amazing grace he has shown to us. Let's continue in singing this morning with one that uh, we all probably know quite well, hymn number 202, Amazing Grace. And you may be seated. We are reminded of the wonderful grace of our God who reigns above. And today we come to worship Him in this place, remarking of the wondrous ways that He is perhaps at work in your life, the ways He is consoling your heart, hopefully strengthening you, giving you peace in times of turmoil and tribulation. Certainly, we come together this morning recognizing that those things are a certainty in this life. If we haven't faced hard times before, be sure hard times are to come, but there's also much to take joy in as we see people professing their faith in Jesus Christ, coming to a place where their hearts are humbled, where they repent before him and believe in the gospel. Certainly, that's what we're praying for this week as we approach VBS. I'm reminded time and time and again, and in preparation, as all of you, many of you, have been preparing for VBS, you know, at the end of the day, that is what it is all about. Um, We don't do this for adulation, any kind of applause. 
We don't do it that our hearts, hopefully we don't do it that our hearts are welled up with our own self-praise or perhaps self-satisfaction in the things that we did. Remember last week we talked and we'll continue to talk this week about how the things that we do, if we do them out of a dutiful obligation, that isn't the sacrifice that our God desires. He desires sacrifice of thanks. And so we come to him with that sacrifice, giving of our time, our talents, perhaps our tithes and offerings this morning. As we lay them at his feet, we recognize that we do so all that he might be glorified. In this upcoming week, that's our prayer and desire, that he would be glorified as we share with the kids that come through, that they would come to a saving knowledge of faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord, that he might work on their hearts and open their eyes to his holy word, that they might see their need for him. And so we come now to a time of prayer this morning on the heels, the heels of VBS, approaching VBS quickly, ready for what God is going to do. And we do so with hearts that desire to see him share to open eyes of each one that comes through our doors. And so I invite you now to pray with me, lifting up this coming week and a a thankfulness for how God has been using each one of you to prepare for what he's going to do in these days ahead. So let's go before him in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Lord, we praise your name that you have called us as your people, that you have given us the truth of your word and opened our eyes to it. And Lord, as we look on at the ways that you're going to be working here in this very room, Lord, and in the rooms down the hall, in these days ahead, there will be students that come through that sit in these very seats who hear the gospel message. And Lord, we pray that that gospel message would fall on fertile soil, that you would use it, Lord, that you would open hearts and eyes that they might see the glorious news that Jesus Christ saves, that he covers us in his blood, that we can live life anew and have the hope of eternity to worship you forever. Oh Lord, what a joy it is to have that privilege even now for us. We, those you have called out, we pray that you would be at work here in us in these days that are ahead, preparing us that we might not spend this week in hopes of just getting through. Certainly it's a busy week, Lord, that we wouldn't spend this week in hopes of getting a pat on the back, but that we would bring each talent, each responsibility with a heart of sacrifice, of thanksgiving before you. We thank you for the joy of being a part of this mighty work that's ahead this week and ask that you'd be preparing the way now for all that come through these doors, that they might be receptive to the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. It's in his most holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we come to Psalm 53. Psalm 53, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to get them out. If you don't, there are Bibles provided in the pews in front of you. And if you are um, wanting to identify where it is in your Bible, Psalm, of course, falls pretty much right in the middle, and we're getting pretty close to the middle of Psalms. Um, It's noted here, page 475 in the Pew Bibles. Psalm 53, a hymn that reminds us that there is none who does good. If you would, please stand with me in reverence for the Word of God as we come to it now. It says, to the choir master, according to Machalath, a maskeel of David. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have those who work evil no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon God. There they are in great terror, where there is no terror. For God scatters the bones of him who encamps against you. You put them to shame, for God has rejected them. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel 
be glad. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Let's prepare now and ask God that he would prepare our hearts as we sing a song, perhaps we might say, of reflection on the wonderful name of our God with hymn number 101, a short chorus for us as we prepare to study together. His name is Wonderful. Oh Lord, your name is wonderful. You are our mighty king. The word become flesh, dwelt among us. We praise you and we thank you for the salvation that is in you. We thank you for your holy word and pray now that as we come before you desiring this food, this spiritual nourishment, that you would nourish our spiritual bodies. Lord, build us up, strengthen us, that we might grow in the knowledge of the Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we come to Psalm 53. Um, Interestingly here for us, um, if you have your Bibles open, um, you can turn back for a moment to Psalm 14, Psalm 14, and kind of look at Psalm 14 in comparison to Psalm 53. It's quite interesting because Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 mirror each other pretty well. Um, In fact, it is uh, widely thought and assumed that 53 was taken from 14. You can probably see the similarities as you're looking there. Some differences for sure, but by and large, we see that David, as he writes Psalm 53, takes from what was written in Psalm 14 and remembers his God, the the truth that his God lays before us, the reality of man's sin. And and it's likely, you say, well, why are there two psalms that are almost the same. I read it first time in Psalm 14. Do I need it again in Psalm 53? Well, certainly we would argue that you could use this, we could use this time and time and time again, a reminder for us of our sin nature. But what's interesting as we start off in Psalm 53 is that there's a note given there, and and it says that this is to the choir master according to Machalath. And that was most likely a tune that was quite familiar to the people of Israel. It might be uh, perhaps something where we would look at and say, if you ever sing Old MacDonald Had a Farm and Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, you'd recognize how the tune is actually the same. They ripped each other off. Man. But for this here, Machalath was a tune that the people in Israel knew well. And so the words that are written here in Psalm 53 would have been those that David specifically wrote to go with that tune. And I think there's great benefit to that. We can see that. None of you have forgotten Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, have you? 
No, certainly not. And there are other tunes that would probably ring familiar for us. But the, the benefit of putting these words to a song that was familiar to the people would have been so vast. They would have the opportunity to remember the God who reigns, the God who looks down on the children of man in verse 2 to see if there is any who understand. And he comes to a conclusion. This is a conclusion we're going to talk much about today and one that should be quite humbling for us. But at the onset of this passage, there is a clear message that really encompasses the entire psalm. It encompasses the entire psalm as a whole. You see the theme running throughout these six verses. King David is considering the fool. He's considering the state of mankind and where they find themselves in the eyes of God. The Lord. He talks here in the beginning of chapter of Psalm 53, verse 1, and he mentions this fool, this fool. And we ought to pay close attention to who this fool is. You know, I, as I was considering all that David wrote here, I couldn't help myself with a quote from Mr. T, but I think it fit quite well. I say it certainly as a point of probably drawing on some memories for us, but these words, I pity the fool, really do speak largely. I think we see a kind of a similar refrain here in Psalm 53. The fool is to be pitied. The fool is to be pitied. We have an insight here into the heart of the one who is characterized as a fool. And this is no trivial statement. You recall elsewhere in Scripture, we are instructed very clearly to be careful how we use the word fool. Um, we're not just to call someone a fool. Perhaps you have um, times where you've been driving in the car and you've had to bite your tongue. Um, you think about that word fool. But it's a serious, a very serious word, one that we should not take lightly, and it is perhaps a description that catches your eye. Specifically, when we read verse 1, it is reminiscent here of what we discussed when we were studying Psalm 19. You remember Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God heavens declare the glory of God. And, and you'll recall when we studied Psalm 19, we said that when man looks on at creation, he is without excuse. All who live and move and breathe are able to clearly perceive that God is the creator. We cannot look at the world today. We can't look at the stained glass windows and assume that they just showed up. God has revealed himself in creation and all of creation sings. Creation sings of the grand design of the master. When the birds chirp, we are reminded that those chirps were given to them by the sovereign creator. And much in this, we see this fool, and, and considering perhaps what we're saying here, and in response, he himself, though, does not give credit as we say it should be given. No, he says instead, there is no God. A fool looks on at the world and does not pay attention to the way that God has revealed himself in the grand design of creation. You see, for you and I this morning, we're not looking at a lightning bolt striking some primordial goo. That's not what happened. It's not what God's word teaches us, and it undermines the entire narrative of the gospel throughout all of Scripture. We're not talking about this billions of years of evolution. We're talking about a God who created, and on the seventh day he rested. We're talking about the God of the universe who has revealed himself to us. Those who are redeemed revealed himself in two ways. 
first generally, but then specially, generally in all of creation, but specially through the proclamation of his word, specifically through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.20 says this, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so they are without excuse. And I won't belabor this, though perhaps we could probably never belabor it. We've studied this in Psalm 19, but the point here is we come now this morning to a fool who says in his heart, yes, I see these things. I see the stained glass windows. I see the beauty of Penn's woods that have been kind of destroyed. I I see the beauty of creation, but when I look on, I say, there is no God. What a fool to say such a thing. In saying this, we've discussed the reality that such a reflection on God's creation can certainly point us to the realization that this did not just come to be, but salvation comes when we recognize that Jesus is Lord According to Psalm 53, all men at some point in their lives, even those who are now redeemed, at some point in their lives stood as those opposed to God. There's a striking message given here, and it reminds us of Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In the heart of the fool, there is a direct rejection that takes place It takes the place of the general revelation given, and out of this comes a damnable lie that frames the way that they live. The fool says in his heart something that we ourselves could now never utter. There is no God. When a man proclaims and lives by such a lie, one of the interesting things here is that as the fool looks on, as the fool thinks to himself, that there is no God, that is not without consequence. You'll remember last week we talked about the consequences of standing in front of a holy creator, a sovereign Lord who is the judge, and having to face the judgment that is due all men. Those who would reject him will find themselves in utter catastrophe. But from this mindset, the mindset that there is no God, we must understand that there are resulting consequences that always flow from that kind of thinking. Those who believe there is no God live in such a way that reflects that. They live in a way that reflects their rejection of the sovereign Lord. David rightly recognizes here that all have fallen and that the one who lives in this, who continues onward, presses and professes to himself that God is a mere figment. He persuades himself that the conscience which knows him to be the creator is but a nagging deception that plagues the mind. I consider here this morning this fool who says there is no God. He is not one that is without excuse. He is one that should have every reason to recognize that the creation was created by a sovereign creator. But what happens when a man instructs his heart in a way like the fool did? One of the things we hold to be true as the redeemed is that the word of God clearly instructs us in righteousness. All morality, remember we talked a while ago about ethics and morality. All morality flows from God. Romans 2, 14 to 16 says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So there's a reality here 
that as the fool says in his heart, there is no God, his foolishness is in part revealed by the reality that his conscience even bears witness against that. The fool says in his heart, there is no God, but his conscience would have him at least in a slight inkling to recognize otherwise. There's a reality that all men live in, that God has placed the law upon the hearts of men. Though what's interesting is evolutionists and atheists reject this grand truth. As fools, they assume that there is no objective morality. They assume that men are no more constrained to a certain right or wrong than a gorilla or a dog. And to this, perhaps we would take the quote from Dr. Elizabeth Mitchell, never get your theology, never take your theology from a chimp. Interesting words Have you ever taken your theology from a chimp? You see, we as believers are are given insight into the holy truth that God has ordained. It's not from animals or from some form of genetic predisposition that we attain morality. Though cultures vary, the principles of morality do not. Principles of morality do not. And perhaps this is why there's such an uproar in recent days over the Ten Commandments being brought back in to some schoolrooms. Specifically, you might have read that that's happening in Louisiana. And I believe there's a movement to get that going in Texas as well. Why are people so opposed to the Ten Commandments being put back into schools? It's because it brings their consciences a reminder It brings their consciences a reminder of what God has already revealed and placed into the hearts of all men. So that as a fool says in his heart, there is no God, in the moment he says that, his conscience says, whoa, wait up, hold a minute. And so we read in Scripture these people have to sear their consciences. They have to do things to distract. And certainly the Ten Commandments being brought back into the schoolroom Well, that kind of makes it hard to distract yourself. But the fact for us this morning is that when man act as though there is no God, there are effects. There are clear signs that we see lived out. When men deny God's existence, iniquity, sin abounds. When men deny that there is a sovereign creator, when men deny and say as the fool does, there is no God, could we say simply, stuff happens. Stuff happens. This is not without implication. As we consider what happens when men say there is no God, David makes clear here that those who say such things are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is no one, none, who does good. When men uh, abandon or reject and oppose the God of the universe, he begins down a path of abominable iniquity. When a man rebels and rejects the Lord, denying his sovereignty, rule, and even existence, he inevitably ventures into sin and often at a rapid pace. And David was looking on here at the world full of men and women who were acting in this way, rebelling against the Lord and denying his existence. They denied any form of objective morality, any standard by which they would be held to. Good morning. And so for us this morning, as we consider the God of the universe who has instated these truths for us to abide by, we recognize that when men forget God, 
Or perhaps we might say when men actively try to refute God. They start down a path that leads to crime, penalties, efforts to do things that are ungodly. And if you have any question about this, look for a moment, because we have it practically before us today, look in the cities throughout our country who have decided that law and order has no place. What starts to happen God is the ultimate giver of law and authority. And for those who reject God, in a grand scale, I would argue that we see the things that we see taking place in cities where they say, no police, please, and looters come, and violence ensues. Things don't get better, they get much worse. The things going on in the world today are but a small illustration. But the point is, when there is no perceived penalty for sin, when we come together and and when men come together and they assume that there is no penalty, no consequence for sinning against the Lord, they will find themselves abounding in sin. When men are left to their own devices and believe that there is no arbiter for their crimes, they will engage in wickedness at a level that we perhaps today can't even quite imagine. And at a a pace faster than any Olympian you will watch this summer. When men deny the Lord, sin abounds. But lest we get on our high horses and we point at the world around us who lives in this manner, we might be humbled then by the last part of verse 1. There is none who does good, not even one. That's sobering because it lumps us in with the rest of creation that rebels against the Lord. This morning, in Psalm 53, we are brought to a place where God is taking inventory. There is none who does good, and in verse 2 it says, God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any. Is there but one who seeks after God? And he comes to a conclusion. Each one, they have all fallen away. No one seeks after God. Have you considered that this morning? That no one seeks. This is perhaps one of the biggest problems with um, some of the modern churches of the day. There has been a movement long before today that started called the seeker-sensitive movement. The problem with that movement is that it forgets Psalm 53 because its premise is wrong. Its premise is wrong. A seeker-sensitive movement is sensitive to no one because there is no seeker. There is no seeker. There is no one who does good, and as God looks down from heaven on the children of man... There isn't any who seek after God. In the following verses, the Lord looks on at creation, taking inventory, and as he considers them, he reaches a conclusion, and it's a harsh conclusion. All have gone astray. All are enslaved to sin. All have fallen away. This is a reality that we must consider Because for each one of us this morning, though we are now redeemed and praise the Lord that we have come to know Jesus Christ, that he has opened our eyes, bringing us to a place of repentance, all of us had gone astray. All were at one time enslaved to sin. Romans 6, 16 to 18 says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? 
either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." There's an interesting principle that's laid out here for us this morning, and it is a theological point, but it's really a point of our state. Men are one of two things. They're either slaves to sin or they're slaves to righteousness. All have fallen and find themselves in slavery one way or another, and it is only through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved All men are held enslaved. And for those who are enslaved by sin, there is a penalty. Romans 6.23, which we talked about last week, the wages of sin is death. At the time of David's writing, it seems clear that there was certain trouble that appeared to be on the horizon. David looked on at the wages of the enemy, the evil that abounded, and remarked, on their depravity. It was as though the wicked were going unchecked. That those who said there is no God lived like there is no God and there was no end in sight. If you watched the New England Patriots win all those Super Bowls, you might have felt a little similarly. Cheating and still winning over and over and over again. In the final two verses of our passages, we are reassured that destruction will one day come for those who try to stand against the Lord. God will one day strike them with fear. His victory is and will always be. No man can stand against him, though he patiently calls all to repentance. Now, what's fascinating here for us this morning as we consider Psalm 53 is that it was actually a passage of Scripture that the Apostle Paul had in mind as he wrote to the church in Rome. The Apostle Paul, as he wrote, did so with reference to what is referenced here in Psalm 53. Lest we think that this is but a temporary truth, Paul brings it in that we might understand it on a universal level. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. As the Apostle Paul wrote, he recounted the truth that we see here, reminding us that that truth that David recognized, that the Lord used him to write, is also true of those who stand today. Starting in verse 9 of Romans chapter 3. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. In bringing light to the continuing reality of Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, Paul here in Romans 3 speaks to the fact that each one of us is included 
and those who do not do good. And I can understand, perhaps you're reading through Psalm 53, and you know many of the things that David went through in his life. You know many of the groups he was up against, and you say, well, certainly I'm no Goliath. Certainly I'm no Philistine. But Paul makes clear to us that as the Lord shares through David in Psalm 53, this is not a temporary truth, but a timeless one. All of mankind has fallen short of God's glory. Each and every one. I I can remember a preacher once kind of recounting this truth, speaking of babies. And he says, for those who have small children at home, they are really vipers in diapers. Vipers in diapers. Considering our daughter tipped over the dog bowl today and soaked herself, starting to see some of that. Sweet as they may be, there is a reality that no one seeks God. As we've said, it's fascinating that today there are any who would proclaim to be seeker sensitive because they're really out there for an audience not of one but of none. They claim to be those who are making themselves available to the unbeliever who is seeking God, but we are reminded in this passage that there is no such man that never describes the unbeliever. A seeker is only the one who God has opened their hearts and given the eyes to see. You and I, we now seek God because he has opened our eyes to the truth of his gospel. I think that we would often be surprised at how widespread the thought that contradicts this is. There are many today who do not believe what we read in Psalm 53 and what it says in, Psalm th- in Romans 3. If, if you doubt that, take a moment with me and consider some of the other world religions. Islam. We're starting with a big one. It says that salvation is by good deeds. Bad news. Psalm 53, there is none who does good. Judaism, though there might be varying opinions, many believe hell is temporary and heaven is attained by ritualism and good works. Whoops, there's no one who does good. Mormonism says salvation is a road, a journey. It's works-based. There is none who does good, though. In the American Worldview Inventory, a 2020 survey conducted by the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University says that of those who describe themselves as Christian, 52%, 52% accept a works-oriented means to God's acceptance. But bad news, there is none who does good. So for us this morning, this is a big issue. It's a big deal. You say, yes, I know that there's no one who does good. All have fallen. But the reality for us is I don't know how often we really sit with that, nor do I think we recognize how many have fallen prey to believing that when they stand before the Lord, their good works will amount to anything. A lot of people believe they can do good that they can achieve God's favor. But Romans 3.28 says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Moreover, if you look in verse 20 of Romans 3, as we read, we see what brings a man to the knowledge of their sin is not flashy entertainment or sermons based on movies. No. What brings a man to the knowledge of their sin is the knowledge of the law. You want to know why schools want to get those Ten Commandments out? It's 
because the law brings knowledge of our sin. We look at Old Testament Israel and we consider the sacrificial system and all the things that they obeyed. Do you know what the point of that was? It was to bring them to a place where they realized they couldn't do enough. There was none who does good. It was that God might open their eyes to the law that he has written on their hearts, that they might have their hearts turned to how grievously they've sinned against the sovereign creator. And when we consider evangelism, when we consider the state of the world today, we must start with a proper biblical understanding of where men find themselves. No one is neutral. No one is righteous apart from Christ. All have sinned. All stand against him. No one seeks the Lord. Yet God in his mercy has opened up his truth, the glorious truth of his salvation. And the truth is that at one time, each one of us stood opposed to the Lord. When his law, though, however, bore witness against us, we were shown the need that we have for him the desperate depravity of our souls. And in him we see shown the message of the gospel, the truth of the salvation that is available as a remedy for the sins that we have committed. And it's interesting now as we come to a close here this morning, as we consider these truths, the law brings about the knowledge of sin. This is a practical application for us as we get ready to spend time with kids during VBS week. Do we help children understand their need? So often we, we paint Jesus as if he is this, this Jesus who, who loves you and, and he wants to frolic with you through the meadows. Before we talk about how loving Jesus is, though, we better talk about how sinful we are. Otherwise, we won't ever understand how much we need him. The law brings the knowledge of sin. The law helps for us to recognize that we are lying, stealing adulterers, murderers, and that we could never stand before a holy God, but that Jesus Christ will and does for all who repent and believe in his name. We have an opportunity to share this in the days and weeks ahead, but as we consider the gospel message, as we consider Psalm 53, recognize this morning that there is none who does good, and that's why we need someone who does. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yeah, that's the glorious hope for us today, and there's no amount of anything that we could do to achieve what Christ has achieved through his death and resurrection. We have a responsibility to carry that message. The truth of the eternal law of the Lord is where we start, recognizing that it points to our sin. It teaches us. We said last week, the law is a teacher it points to us living in the trenches of sin. And then we point, and God points us to the word which will work to bear witness of how desperate we are and the gospel which shows the abundance of God's grace which is available. When we speak with unbelievers, let us keep in mind the spiritual battle at hand as you talk with those who are unregenerate. And I mean that in the biblical sense who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, might you remind yourself that there is none who does good. That they stand in a place where they are saying there is no God. And God looks down on heaven on the children of men and recognizes that not even they seek after him. We too were once in that, regarded in that manner, Yet he graciously pursued us, saved us, and changed us that we might live daily to him. And so this is the joy of our hearts, but might we remember that the law is the very thing which pointed us to the need for our salvation. Verse 6, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Let's rejoice in our common salvation today, but remind ourselves of the state of men's hearts worldwide. Completely 
sinful, not doing good, not able to earn anything. I remember speaking, and I'll close with this, with someone this past week, and I think it's a practical application for us. There are many philanthropists throughout the world, many who, who seek to, to do things because I would argue their conscience has written on it the very things that God has instilled in all of men, this moral law that no one can scrub out completely. But as you consider those philanthropists, and the one that was brought to my mind was Mother Teresa. And as we consider Mother Teresa and and the many things that she did, might I encourage you today that not even she will be able to stand before a sovereign Lord on account of her works. But she will be able to stand before him if she appeals to the cross of Christ to the salvation that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Might the same thing be on our minds today. There is none who does good, but Jesus enables us now to live righteous lives for him. Let us appeal to him the work he has done in us and remind ourselves that there is none who does good, but our God has worked in us that we might now not be enslaved to sin, but to righteousness. And that is our desire and hope for all those who would hear in the days and weeks ahead as we share the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. What a glorious truth it is to know that though there is none who does good, there is one who does. Our conscience bears witness against us, opens our eyes to our desperate need And that need has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And in him we rejoice this day. Might you cause for that joy to fill our hearts as we go from here, that we might spread it boldly with those who we encounter in these moments ahead. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close in singing this morning, I invite you to stand with me for hymn number 201, Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
Lord, we thank you for your grace in giving us more than we deserve and sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins so that we might live to him. We praise you for the work you did in him and his death and resurrection and ask that as we go from here, we would be reminded of the glorious hope we have in you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.